He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. became a significant siege rather resembling scenes from Rambo as uh, Molyneux kept firing all over the neighbourhood. Hi, I'm Jesse Mulligan and this is Season 4 of Crimes NZ, a podcast where we speak to people connected in one way or another with some of New Zealand's most infamous crimes and we're kicking this season off with the Napier Siege, a tense three-day standoff that took place in May 2009 and resulted in the deaths of Constable Len Snee and the man who'd barricaded himself in, Jan Molinar. Hawke's Bay Today senior reporter Doug Lang was there as the siege unfolded. He was largely unknown around town, really, except he had this uh, history relating to cannabis and obviously the, the weapons that were unfolded in his house. Um, his family were around Napier, particularly uh, his mum and uh, brothers, and that, sort, that sort of thing. So uh, nothing as far as the general public were concerned to cause any great alarm at all. As it turns out, there might have been a bit of history and concern um, amongst friends, particularly relating to the weapons, but yeah, nobody really raised it until it was too late. Uh, he's described here in my notes as a loner with a persecution complex prone to bursts of extreme temper, so some signs there that things might go wrong at some stage. It's probably a thing, possibly even more so today, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there are characters around these days with this prone to... Uh, Burst of temper if they've got the weapons around. I guess it's one thing about the whole guns situation that the if the guns are out of the way, then these sorts of characters can't get hold of them. Um, but in this case, as we know, this guy had all sorts of amazing sort of weapons, you know, just about up to the rocket launcher category. What kicked things off that day? Well, basically, as we know, um, Len Snee and um, Bruce Miller uh, um, and Grant Diver, uh, three senior constables, long serving cops around here and they'd gone there to execute a uh, cannabis uh, search warrant, basically arrived at this house in what's known as um, Breakneck Road. And Napier's actually called Torsa Road, but it's a very steep uh, road near the old Napier Cemetery, and quite a dampish sort of territory, really. And uh, yeah, yeah, during the visit, uh, Lenny Holmwood, a friend of uh, Jan Molinar, <coughs> excuse me, arrived, and basically at that point, uh, uh, Jan Molinar flipped, I suppose is the word, he, Grabbed a gun, ordered everybody out, and uh, the, sh- the shootings took place within seconds. And as we know, the uh, three officers, then Lenny Holmwood, the civilian friend, were all shot in the process. So, so sorry, why were they there in the first place? For a cannabis okay. drug search. You know, it was mentioned that Len Snee, who did a lot of jogging in the area, had noticed uh, things about that, that may have um, alerted him to drug the cannabis growing in, in the area somewhere and must have uh, narrowed it down. Uh, I did actually come across a, a colleague who worked as a tradie in the area and he actually asked me about the same property at the same time, noting the uh, the, the smell of cannabis growing in the area. <laughs> but in, uh, there's a bit of uh, familiarity, particularly in a damp area where, where cannabis can in, in grow in quantity can shed off a particular odour that uh, people might detect uh, and also movements around that house would obviously alarm some people and it was just simply that, the standard uh, cannabis uh, search by the police. Okay, thanks to the team at Ngatanga Sound and Vision we've got a clip here of what those living in the area said the incident was like. It was about 9.30, I was standing outside on the deck and I heard about four or five shots and let you see the smoke coming from the gunshot. A little while later there was there was another half a dozen in quite quick succession. He must have a semi-automatic or something. There was an officer outside our building who told us to get off the roof. There was a man with a high-powered rifle that had shot two people. There's two helicopters in front of me that have chopped in AOS recruits. I can hear the loud tailors calling on to uh, give themselves up. They weren't going to go away and no one can go, go in or out from the street at the moment. They've locked down three hillside or hilltop schools here. Uh, kids are in the classes. Police have taken the precautions of putting spike at both ends of the street in case the offender runs from the house, jumps in the police car and tries to make off in that. Well, OK, some um, varied descriptions of what's going on there. And someone mentioned the armed offenders squad. They arrived shortly after that, Doug. Yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, armed police rather than armed offenders squad to start off with every man on deck, really, uh, it was... Cops, are, for example, at the courthouse on court orderly duty about to start their court day. They're in the Napier Police Station, there was an officer from Auckland who was uh, looking around the place with the prospect of moving to Napier and things like that. They hear the 
the, everything sort of in the direction and basically well, almost sprint down the road. There were and some of that, some actually ran the length of the road from town to get down there, and obviously uh, very quickly realised what the situation was. Uh, it was around about nine thirty uh, in the morning, a Thursday morning, and uh, as we know now, you know plans quickly put in place for what became a significant siege, rather resembling scenes from. Rambo, as uh, Molinar kept firing all over the neighbourhood, hundreds of shots basically eventually detected during the examinations that followed. And uh, by mid-afternoon, the STG, that's a special uh, tactics group, was on on hand with with their vehicles, and uh, the army also had their LAVs arrive overnight, and everything all in action the next day. And of course, the, the police sat out the whole arrangement for two days before finally breaking into into the house and uh, finding that uh, Ian Monaghan had, had taken his own life. Yeah, OK, so let's cycle things back a bit. Can you tell me about the house? Someone described it as a, as a hobbit house, I think. Yeah, exactly. you got your main house right up against uh, the uh, roadside, if you like. It, it is a two-storey house itself, but there's a structure at the back, which is really the hobbit house. It's almost like a lookout. And at one stage, uh, Yard Molina retreated to that and could get a good view of everything in all all directions, pretty much up and down uh, the road, which goes down into uh, Carlisle Street, which is a main thoroughfare into town, very busy area. And um, he'd really set the house up by the sounds of things. So w- what do you know about um, you know his sort of ammunition and armour? Yeah, they had a wide range of weapons, I think 18 armourable weapons in the house at the time and hundreds of rounds of ammunition that were discovered it quickly became obvious to police through questioning of friends and stuff that they believed that uh, he was a man that wouldn't be taken alive. Um, he established some sort of paranoia and protectivity around his uh, the cannabis that he was growing in the house. So where, where do you come in, by the way, Doug? Do you remember the time and when you found out what was going on? Yeah, no, I was uh, working as a reporter at Hawke's Bay today, the newspaper, the one that had emerged from the two previous newspapers in the area. I was on, driving on my way to the courthouse that morning to cover a court case when a, another media person uh, rang me and asked me what was going on in town, so that's effectively the first I heard of it. Um, I just did a bit of an assessment of myself of where other journos would be and what they would be be doing and basically headed for somewhere where I knew I could sort of keep track of the uh, the actual events unfolding rather than initially being at the scene. Once I got that out of the way, I knew what was going on. Um, I knew very early in the piece the names of the officers in, involved. I'd known them for you know, virtually all the time that I've been working in, in Napier since uh, 1987, which is around about the time all three of them started. And by the way, Bruce Miller and Grant Diver, they're two injured in the incident, are uh, still in fact on the job. Had you come across Jan Molinar before? No, essentially never heard of him. Uh, I was familiar with his with his mum more or less just by sight than anything else. I still see her and her brother occasionally around town. He hadn't been named as a figured well in the court uh, news, for example. Yeah. yeah. And in the early hours of the siege, was it true they thought he might have been mobile, that he'd possibly left his house and, and could in fact be anywhere? Yeah, that was really a case of taking all precautions. Practically speaking, there wouldn't have been uh, much opportunity opportunity for him to leave, but they sort of had to be prepared if he did become mobile. Obviously, many people would have come uh, become under threat in the serious of it, of it all. It was pretty obvious the way they pretty much cordoned it, the whole town. You know, anything up to a quarter of a quarter of Napier or quarter of the inner Napier area was seriously impacted for this couple of days through not being able to get home, um, all sorts of things like that, as the cordons remained in place, obviously designed to make sure that if he did try to move in any way, that he wasn't going to be able to get too far. It must have been pretty challenging to cover an event that ended up lasting for three days. Yeah, uh, the, the final announcements were made on uh, Saturday, the, the major press conference that you know it was all over, um, standing in sort of on a, on a watch, if you like, down at the Cordon, which was in a street called Faraday Street. The uh, police had based themselves at the uh, Army Territorial Base uh, locally, and that's, it was from there that the vehicles were coming and going. And yeah, Obviously, they were worried that uh, Molinar may, may have been able to be following them on, say, for example, police radio and having ideas of what they were doing. So there wasn't a lot of information really being given out, especially if it could have got into the wrong hands, if you know what I mean. And uh, you, you're sort of really 
assessing from the movements that were going on as to what stage things would happen. So occasionally during the first night, you'd see the SDGs and that sort of thing move up and down. They would obviously head up to the area of the house. I think we became aware that they weren't, they were under instructions not to go in front of it into what might have been a line of sight. Um, but they'd come back, and, and during the next day, of course, that sort of thing became less and less frequent. And of course, with no further shots being fired, which they had done well into the night on that Thursday night. Yeah, it became, once that sort of drew from two hours to three hours to four hours without any more shots, it was starting to become likely yeah, that, it, that he was no longer a threat. But the, obviously the police uh, pattern had to really wait uh, until the time finally came on the Saturday, late Saturday morning, I think, from memory off the top of my head, before they finally entered the house. There uh, was no sign of him being alive. They believe they knew that he had shot himself at some stage. Back to our archival audio, here's Eastern District Commander Sam Hoyle talking to Mary Wilson about the situation as it wore on. I can say that the risk to other people on the hill right now is uh, uh, quite low. But you're not letting people go back in there, people who've finished work for the day and would like to go home? No, we're not. We've um, set up a centre for them. Uh, the assistance of civil defence. Um, we obviously can't let people who live in the immediate environs go back in. He is armed with what appears to be high-powered rifles, which gives him quite some range. And how often is he firing the gun? Spasmodic. And the range would be what on that weapon? It depends exactly on which, what, what the weapon is, and we're not 100% certain, but we know from what we've seen that it is a high power, but you know, anything up to and slightly over a kilometre. Have you got any idea of what else he has in the house in, in terms of weapons and how much ammunition? We have some reports that he has explosives in the house, which we're taking seriously, even though it's still as yet unconfirmed. Uh, we will have reports that he has uh, many, many uh, rounds of ammunition and may have access to a number of semi-automatic weapons. Pretty scary times for the people of Napier and New Zealand. And at some point, presumably, Doug Lang, um, the negotiations started. What do you know about that? That sort of thing was also kept pretty quiet. We had a, a lot more about that, of course, in the time from people like Lance Burnett, but at, at that time really didn't know much about that. You sort of had to presume that that's what they were trying to do, is to try and uh, talk them into surrender, which was a difficult proposition at, uh, at any time. In terms of the danger, that can be really exemplified by the number of holes that were found in houses, you know, anything up, way up the hills, miles away. Quite a few houses had quite significant damage. And once the helicopters were no longer able to fly immediately above the area, one was at a base, probably the best part of 800 metres from the house, down on Carlisle Street, waiting. And at one stage, there were reports that they could hear the pinging of shots as they rained down on the helicopter from the sky, hitting the rotor blades. Heck. What about the police who were hit in that first incident? Um, what happened with them? One was injured and one ended up uh, dying. So, yes, yeah, so Len Snee died at the scene, pretty much at the time that Len Holmwood, the, uh, the civilian, was still still there, basically. Grant Diver and Bruce uh, Miller had to seek cover, uh, ultimately spent quite some time in, in hospital with, with their injuries. As I mentioned, both ended up getting back to work and are still on the job. Today, Grant's just recently got another police dog. He was there with his dog on the day, and uh, Bruce Miller's working, currently working in prevention. And then there's Lance Burdett, the police's top police negotiator at the time. It sounds like his instructions or his advice wasn't quite followed to the letter, though. Yeah, there's been been lots of reports of the way that sort of went over the time. I guess uh, these things are sort of quite operational things where there can be any range of opinions. At some point, uh, Molinar was put on the phone with yep. Delwyn Keefe. Who was she and how did that conversation go? Delwyn was, the, um, was his partner. And from reports, she was put on to speak live to him. There have been questions about whether that should have been done in some other form over the years. But uh, was to speak to him, gave her some indication that she wanted him to um, surrender, but he apparently indicated that that wasn't something he was going to do. So what do we know now about what was going on inside that house with Jan Molinar and how it eventually ended? Well, I guess it's, in many ways, it's, it's, it's sort of the classical case of a guy who just decides that he's, he's not going to surrender. The, the image was that he had all these weapons because he felt under threat from gang members who knew of his um, 
uh, of his cannabis and that he may have been dealing to people that they wanted to do business with maybe. And they, how much of that was actually factual has always been disputed. But he eventually took his own life. Yeah, indeed. He obviously felt he had no option. Yeah, and uh, was found in his bedroom when the police entered the house. Anything interesting in the 2010 coroner's report? He didn't uncover anything particularly new by that stage. He haven't got the central character to tell you everything mm. that's happened and why. The police have been pretty scathing, but no one had thought uh, to tell them how dangerous he was. But I wonder if anyone could have predicted him doing this. No, there didn't seem to be any anybody at all that predicted that. He had some quite firm friends around town. I think he was a bit into the music scene as, as well. Um, he pumped a bit of iron, pumped a bit of weights. There are probably be plenty of people around, or well, sad, sad as it is, that do have large firearms collections. And uh, I guess a lot of people that know of those people probably see the people who have got these collections as being no risk or threat at all. But uh, who, who really knows at the end what's going on in other people's minds? You've been listening to Crimes NZ with me, Jesse Mulligan. You can catch more of me Monday to Friday hosting RNZ's Afternoon Show and you can find more episodes of Crimes NZ on the RNZ podcast page. It's also on Apple, Spotify, iHeart or wherever you get your favourite podcasts. Don't forget to follow the series and if you enjoyed it, give it a rating so others can find it too. And if you're looking for something new, check out Red Line. It's a podcast which looks at China's influence here in New Zealand.